You know, Jay, it's almost Christmas time, and I think about my wife asking me this question. I say, you know, what do you buy a hunter? What do you buy the hunter that has everything? What do you? I would say number one on my list this year would be the Scentlock Enforcer. It's, it's a personal ozone generator. A lot of people have been asking me about it. Can I use it in my gym bag? The answer is yes. It's great for hockey players. It's great for football players. Dusty, you use them in your boots. I know some friends of mine that throw trash and put it in their truck. And you know what? It's compact, lightweight. It's about the size of an iPhone. If your phone battery is getting low, it's got a USB port on it. It's got a one-hour setting, a three-hour setting for the ozone. It's amazing, Jake. It really is. I really think this is the perfect gift because this isn't. This is kind of brand new. Like this has not been around for a very long time. Put it in your tote. You can put it in your hanging closet, and it'll clean your clothes almost as good as running it through the laundry. The point being is that this particular item is one thing that the hunter in your life doesn't have yet, and they'll thank you for it. It would be something that I would so much appreciate under my tree. You know what? It'll even fit in the stocking. Now, we talked to Tim Gothier over at Scentlock Enforcer, and he says that if you order online by December 19th, you'll receive your Scentlock Enforcer by Christmas. Or if you want to pick it up immediately, go to the Scentlock Enforcer website and check out the dealer locator. It's www.scentlockenforcer.com. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 179. Ken Jorgensen, the history of Ruger, wind, and the long shot, and the proper load. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Today's show is sponsored by the Scentlock Enforcer, the Euro Hanger, and Morse's Sporting Goods. <laughs> Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, I'm Dustin Kaismore from Kaismore's Back to Nature Taxidermy in Ohio, and I am about to push play on my favorite podcast, and it should be yours too, the Big Buck Registry, Big Buck Podcast. Hi, this is John Stallone with Interviews with the Masters Podcast, and when I'm not editing my own podcast, I'm listening to the Big Buck Registry with Jay Scott. My name's Steve Pass, and I'm a deer hunter from Pennsylvania, and you're about to push play on my favorite deer hunting podcast, the Big Buck Registry. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. My name is Jay, and as always, I'm more than thankful that you pushed that play button right there on your audio device, your phone, whatever you're listening to us on your car, or maybe you're on watching it on YouTube or something like that. I don't know where you're at, but boy, I am psyched that you're tuning in so that you can digest some of the best deer hunting content that is out there on the podcast waves. And we bring it to you here every single week by dissecting the habits of diehard deer hunters from across the country and bringing it to you so you can do it too. And when I say we, as always, I am referring to me and my good friend and co-host from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. How are you, my friend? Oh, I'm doing great, Jay. You know, I want to start off with wishing everybody from my household to yours a Merry Christmas. Likewise, from the podcast studios, thank you for tuning in and Happy holidays, and uh, I'm just glad that you're with us. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a great time of year, and it's a time that we all can get together with family members and tell great hunting stories, and some will tell lies, and and (laughs) we'll we'll eat and and open gifts to each other. And, man, just a a great time of the year for uh, for families to get together. And, you know, it's really a great time of year for whitetail hunting, too, Jay, or any any kind of hunting if it's uh, still in season. Yeah. The conditions are uh, pretty much as prime as they're going to be. The pressure is starting to come off the the whitetail here in Ohio as Mm -hmm. far as the gun seasons are settling down. And if the weather conditions get colder, we're we're predicted for a 55-degree Monday coming up here, and that's no good. But if the weather conditions settle back down and and then get down into the 20s and 30s, I think that there's still going to be quite a few 
quite a few lucky hunters out there to to fill their tags. Oh wow, no kidding. That's that's some uh, heavy duty temperatures right there. We've had some uh, very low temperatures. We've had some snow here in New Hampshire. The deer season is over, of course, and now I'm turning my sights on to some post season scouting so that I can make some notes for next year and where these deer seem to be traveling and find some new corridors that I didn't know about. And I'm going to start focusing more on the coyote hunting. I want to get out the old Fox Pro that we got from Al Morris and his gang over there at Fox Pro a while back and see what we can stir up and maybe um, take out a few coyotes and help that deer herd. Yeah, I hear that. And uh, I hope everybody's on the nice list this year. <laughs> I hope so, too. I was just looking at the the uh, deer movement predictor, and it looks like if you're still hunting where you're at, and this is like a uh, East Coast predictor, I believe, it looks like Wednesday and Thursday is going to be pretty hot. Those might be your, your best opportunities right there. Very cool. Yeah, I hope uh, everybody gets the opportunity that they've been looking for and uh, fills their whitetail tag. Absolutely. Um, this week's guest is kind of interesting. We're talking to Ken Jorgensen from Ruger. And Ken uh, operates a lot of their marketing department up there. And Ruger, of course, is not far from me in New Hampshire, one of their original headquarters. And their casting facility is up there in Newport, which is just around the corner from me. And we reached out to Ken because we wanted to learn more about the history of Ruger. By gun age, it's really kind of a young company. But they do make some of the, the best firearms that are around and I kind of grew up uh, knowing an awful lot about Ruger, and I think it's because of their local proximity to where I am. And Ken gets on. We get to listen to kind of how that that small company, that, that idea, blossomed into what it is today. So Ken's coming on in just a little bit. Before we get there, let's turn to Jim Keller with the Deer News. The Deer News this week is sponsored by the Eurohanger. You don't have to spend big bucks to hang your big buck. Get yourself a Eurohanger. Facebook.com forward slash Eurohanger, E-U-R-O-H-A-N-G-E-R. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week, potential record Mississippi buck tagged on public land. This story was featured on the foxnews.com website, but was originally featured in Field and Stream and written by Spencer Neuerharth. A hunt that came close to unraveling ended with what may be Mississippi's largest typical buck on record. Josh Clark of Luca, Mississippi, drew a tag for Zone 3 of the Cane Mount Wildlife Management Area in Claiborne County. He'd hunted in Cane Mount before, but never in that zone. Clark noticed the area's potential right away, telling the Clarion Ledger, It was crazy. The rubs I saw, the trees were the size of power poles, and the rubs were three and four feet high, and neither was a big deer there. His confidence didn't last long, though. His first two days of hunting the area passed with no sightings of a big buck. On December 14th, his third day of hunting the area, and the final day of the season, Clark ventured to the creek bottom for one last sit. He laced the area with scent and did some rattling and grunting once he got to the stand. After getting no response, he deemed the spot a bust and decided that it was time to move down. I lowered my gun to the ground, he told the clarion ledger. When I stood up to turn around, I saw a main beam. I said, oh my goodness. Standing in front of him was the monster buck that patrolled the area. But Clark was out of position and his rifle was at the bottom of the tree. He quickly reeled his rifle back up and took a shot when the buck hit an opening. The deer bounded over a hill and Clark followed. Once he crested the skyline, he saw the deer lying dead. The score of the buck remains a bit unclear, however. Mississippi Sportsman reports that the deer is a mainframe 11 point with 17 total points and that it scored 205 inches. The Clarion Ledger reports, however, that the deer is an 18 pointer and that later green scores put the deer closer to 200 inches. To claim the record, the buck will need to beat a net score of 164 and 68 inches, a record set in 2010 by James Saunders after a 60 day drying period. Remember, buyer beware when buying broadheads online. This article was featured on the Deer and DeerHunting.com website and was written by Carrie Butt. Apparently, knockoff products aren't exclusive to overpriced jewelry and handbags. One Illinois hunter learned this the hard way, and his story makes you wonder how many hunters have been duped and didn't know it. Casey Morgan of Northern Illinois discovered this after shooting a doe using a broadhead he believed was from reputable and widely used brand Rage. After all, that's what the product description stated when he purchased a three-pack from a large online generalist store. Imagine his surprise when he shot a deer with a broadhead and discovered it was a cheap knockoff of the original. Morgan was unable to recover the doe, which, as any hunter knows, can be devastating, especially from an ethical standpoint. He was also sick and discovered the condition of the broadhead after shooting the doe. 
It was definitely not something he'd ever observed in several years of using rage broadheads. The broadhead was mangled and bent beyond disbelief. Morgan conducted a bit of a search, was ultimately led to the conclusion that he had purchased a counterfeit product. The moral of the story is clear. Buyer beware. Perhaps even more important to remember the old adage, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Rage Broadheads is one of several archery manufacturers who have been dealing with online bandits. The products are typically manufactured, packaged, even sold from overseas markets. Hence, there is little that can be done to stop the bandits, other than educating consumers to be sure they only buy from reputable retailers. Rage offered its first warning in 2013 when it posted a warning on its Facebook page. The warning indicated that a significant number of counterfeit Rage products were being offered for sale on websites such as Amazon, eBay, and Alibaba. Rage does not have any authorized dealers on any of these sites, and many products being offered on these sites are not authentic Rage products. To ensure that you get authentic, high-performance Rage products, they urge customers to go to a major hunting products retailer and or authorized dealer. Urge Congress to vote on the Bipartisan Sportsman's Act now. This story was originally posted on the National Deer Alliance website. With the 114th Congress nearing adjournment, there is still unfinished business that, if left undone, will once again leave sportsmen out in the cold. The Bipartisan Sportsman's Act has been described as the most important law designed to protect hunting and shooting in nearly two decades. This important legislation includes a number of key provisions that would directly benefit deer and hunters. These include removing gray wolves from the endangered species list. Gray wolves have far exceeded their population targets for delisting, yet anti-hunter interests have been successful at blocking states from managing them in the courts. This has had a devastating impact on deer and other prey species. Second point, ensuring hunting on federal land, open until closed. This provision would declare Federal Bureau of Land Management and Forest Service lands open to hunting unless federal wildlife managers have reason to close them. This new language would prevent anti-hunting interests from working through the court system to block hunting opportunities on these lands. The third point, preventing EPA regulations of lead ammunition. Ammunition is already regulated at the state level and in some cases by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This language will prevent anti-hunting interests from using the court system to ban lead components in ammunition as a way of further limiting hunting participation by sportsmen. This important legislation has been delayed for far too long and it's time for the 114th Congress to act on the Bipartisan Sportsman's Act before it adjourns, said NDA President and CEO Nick Pinizzotto. There is nothing more American than our outdoor traditions, and waiting until the next Congress to take action to protect them is without merit. You can take action by urging your legislators to vote now on the Bipartisan Sportsman's Act. Visit the NDA Advocacy Center, where you can send a letter to your representative quickly and easily. This concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry's Deer News. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. And if you have an idea for future topics or have questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. I hope you all have a Merry Christmas. Thanks to Jim Keller with the Deer News. Without further ado, here's Ken Jorgensen. Ken Jorgensen, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Doing okay. Thank you very much. Excellent, man. We're, we're glad to bring you on. A good friend of mine said that I should get somebody from Ruger on the show, and I said, you know what, that's a great idea because they're right in my backyard. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> driven by the, the plant many times and uh, very familiar with the Ruger Ruger name, as I think the country is, really. I mean, it's a, it is a recognizable brand. It is a it is a recognizable brand. You know, it's uh, it's a fairly young company in the world of firearms, but uh, it certainly has left its mark over the you know since 1949 when it was started. Right, right. And they have a good reputation. I have to be honest. I, I've I've um, played with firearms my whole life. My dad was a big uh, gun enthusiast and he was in the military and let me shoot all the 22s that uh, were he had in his his gun rack and uh, we graduated. <laughs> And as I as I got older, I got to shoot the bigger and bigger guns, um, but Ruger was always a part of that. And um, I'm curious and to learn about all about Ruger. Let's start with you, Ken. First, I want to know about okay. about you first. Tell us about yourself, Ken. Where are you from, and and uh, where do you call home? Well, I'm a farm kid from North Dakota that uh, lived there for a number of years. Worked in a couple of other industries and had the opportunity to come into the gun industry in 1992. Uh, 
was offered a job at Smith and Wesson at the time and took it and uh, moved east. Never thought I'd do that, being a, a Westerner, but uh, it was a great opportunity. Being a gun guy, it was uh, you know sure, certainly a chance to do something different and something I love to do. So I did that uh, for a number of years and then came to Ruger in 2004. Uh, at Ruger, I uh, work as the uh, director of media relations and shooting sports, so I'm involved with. Uh, you know, pretty much the firearms writers and the TV shows and such like that. And, you know, like with you, you know, interviews like this and such and, yeah. you know, getting product into people's hands when they wanted to do things. And, uh, and then I oversee the shooting sports, which, uh, you know, helps me get involved and keeps me in touch with a lot of the competitive side of, of shooting. And of course, it's, it's a big deal. I mean, uh, competitive shooting is a lot of fun and, you know, it can be a lifelong, uh, sport and uh you know we've been uh, quite involved with rimfire we a few years ago we started something called ruger rimfire which a couple of years ago the national shooting sports foundation took over uh but it's been a great entry level shooting sports for people and it's all done with rimfire pistols and rifles and uh uh, it's. I know from a number of stories people have told me, it's led people that uh, started with rimfire to move on to some of the other shooting sports. So we feel really good about that. Very cool. So uh, tell me about life growing up where you grew up. What was, what was that like? Well, like I said, I was a farm kid in North Dakota. Grew up in the fifties and sixties, and uh, you know, life was pretty simple to be honest. Okay. <laughs> you know? All right. Uh, uh, you know, I did a lot of shooting. I still have an old uh, single shot Remington my grandfather gave me, and I was, uh, I don't know, 10, 12, something like that. And I couldn't even venture to guess how many rounds had been through that gun, everything from 22 shorts and longs and long rifles. And, um, did a lot, a lot of shooting. Uh, unfortunately, my hearing uh, kind of attests to that today. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. I did, did some hunting and such, and uh, it was just a great place to be at the time. Uh, I still try and go back as uh, often as I can to hunt pheasants in the fall. Mm-hmm. I was just back there in October and hunting with some friends of mine. And honestly, the hunting is much better today than it was when I was growing up. So, is that right? Uh, but, oh, yeah, yeah. It was... Uh, um, you know, it, it, a lot of things have happened since then. I mean, first of all, the, the Conservation Reserve, uh, Reserve Program, CRP, has been great for hunting. And even though there have been acres taken out of that, uh, you know, grow corn for uh, ethanol and this and that, it's still, uh, it's still had a huge impact on wildlife and has provided a lot more cover that we certainly didn't have back in the 50s and 60s. And, uh, people are just more aware, I think, of the conservation and the needs of wildlife today. So uh, the hunting is, is much better than it was back then. And, uh, I think wildlife is managed better and we're seeing uh, just, you know, seeing mm. more opportunities. Right, right. How was the deer hunting back then? Uh, you know, I wasn't a deer hunter. I know on our farm we had deer from time to time, and I know people that hunted deer. Um, I, I think the deer population today is probably better managed, and, and there are more deer out there. I still have friends, including a couple of brothers, or one brother now that still lives there and, you know, does some hunting and such. And, you know, they are usually successful. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, you said that you had spent some time at was it Smith & Wesson. Uh, tell us about your time there. Well, I was a media relations guy there, uh, you know, dealt with the firearms media, you know, also dealt with uh, the general news media at the time. And, uh, you know, it was an interesting time. I, I was a handgunner, basically, when I when I started out. I mean, that was my, uh, I, I competed with handguns, I hunted with handguns, and uh, so for me, it was a perfect fit. And I, uh, I never really... Uh, I guess I never really took an animal with a long gun until I was probably near 50 years old. You know? So, uh, really? No uh, kidding. Yeah. I was, I was a handgunner all the time. So, uh, you okay. know, I, I, that was a perfect place to be when you were a handgunner. Gotcha. Oh, where do you, or how do, what did, what do you attribute to your love of firearms? It's not, I mean, it sounds like you're passionate about them I and mean, you're in the business. You're, you made a career out, out of working for firearm companies and I can hear it in your voice, quite honestly, that you, you just dig it. Uh, where does that come from? Well, I don't know. I guess growing up kind of where I did and firearms were just kind of part of life. And I think my interest in handguns really came from uh, early on when I was, was interested and expressed an interest in handguns being told, oh, nobody can hit anything with a handgun. Handguns aren't accurate. You can't do anything with a handgun. And of course, to me, that was just a challenge to prove everybody was wrong. So, you know, I set about doing that. And that, that was kind of my interest in handguns. And But I, I guess it's just uh, I enjoy shooting. Uh, I just enjoy kind of the... Uh, I want to say the precision of it. You know, I do a lot of rifle shooting these days. I do a lot of hand loading. I like working up loads. Every time I get a rifle, I sit down and work up a series of loads, go to the range and find the, the load that that gun likes best. And, uh, 
it's just kind of a challenge to me. I like doing that. And uh, mm-hmm. I guess everything about firearms has interested me. The history of gotcha. firearms, and it's uh, it's just a uh, it's been a great way to to earn a living. And I joke with people sometimes. I said it's working for a living. <laughs> Do you feel that way? Is it really that much fun? Oh yeah, it has been over the years. I mean, it, it's it's you know it has its ups and downs, obviously. But uh, you know, I, uh, I I a number of years ago, I was at Smith and West, and uh, there's a publication that's like PR News or PR Weekly or something like that, and I was interviewed for that. And at that time, I, I by them I was by, uh, was named as the number two hardest job in the nation in the PR industry because I worked for Smith and West at a time when guns weren't very popular. But um, you know, like I told them back then, I said I. Uh, I, I, you know, really like my job probably about 75% of the time. Um, I guess I said I like my job 75% of the time. I really like my job, um, you know, probably about 20% of the time. And about 5% of the time, I wish I was doing something else. But that's still not a bad average when you like your job that much. Gotcha. All right. Well, it sounds like a good gig overall. Um, yeah, sounds it's like you're enjoying yourself. A lot of opportunities over the years. Been able to go a lot of places, do interesting yeah. things. and have met a lot of wonderful people. What is the state of the firearm in the United States today? You mean in terms of uh, politics or Pol- in terms yeah, of... Politics and, uh, you know, what are the threats against firearms that, that we may not be readily aware of? And is, is, it, is it a stable thing? Well, I think the overall condition is probably better right now than it's been for a while. Um, obviously firearms have been a, a political issue off and on for, you know, decades. I mean, start, really started, uh, kind of major league back in the Clinton administration and, and, uh, everybody felt it was coming under attack back then. And it was, uh, maybe a little less so during Bush's administration. And obviously during this, this administration right now, everybody's kind of held their breath and wonder what's going to happen next. Um, you know, I guess the plus side for the industry is it's, uh, it's certainly sold a lot of firearms, uh, with with the election of Trump, uh, I think people see that uh, the threats politically being dialed back, at least at the federal level. Right. But then you you know you have a lot of states that are doing different things too, and uh, you know that's something that uh, it's it's never going to go away. I mean it's you know it's kind of like you you're on the two yard line, but you're never going to cross the finish line. You're never going to say uh, you know that's it, uh, game's over, and everything's fine and dandy. It's just never going to happen. Right. Uh, but uh, I think that. There's been a lot of, of, of good things that have happened recently. There's been a lot of court uh, decisions that have been positive. Uh, there's been uh, you know expansion of concealed carry in a lot of states. Uh, so there's been a lot of good things happening. And, and I've seen things lately where polls have shown that people are less interested in firearms or in you know gun control than uh, than they were a decade or two ago. Uh, even the uh, you know the, the quote assault weapon or the modern sporting rifle you know is less of an issue to a lot of people today than it, than it was a while back. So I think those are positive signs. Gotcha. Very interesting. Would you say, and this is always a weird dynamic to me, and I'm not sh- I mean, it makes sense, like supply and demand, I guess, or, or fear driven, is that what it seems like when, and I, I don't want to talk about politics, but I, I just want to make an observation is that when there's a Democrat in the White House, sales seem to go up and it's harder to get ammunition and it's harder to buy guns because there just aren't as many of them, right? And when there's well, a Republican in the White House, it seems like we've got all these freedoms, but there's a flood of guns. Can you? Yeah, what is that well, all about? Well, I think what happens is is uh, when you have a political, when you have an administration that people feel down the road is going to threaten their ability to acquire their own firearms, that you know people go out and, and buy what they want to have just in case they're not going to be able to get it at some point. So that has certainly over the years led to you know rushes to the gun shops and shortages of firearms and people stockpiling ammunition and such. And, um, it, it's. Uh, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways, but it certainly has had an impact on, on the industry. And it's had an impact on consumers. I mean, people that want to go out and buy uh, the ammunition. We saw this a few years back with our Ruger Rimfire series and, and the NSSF Rimfire series. Is people were having a hard time even finding enough ammunition to come and shoot a match, let alone do any practicing. You know, Rimfire was so hard to come by for so long. Uh, you know, we get into a Republican administration, people kind of feel, well, that, that threat is not there, at least at the federal level. And, you know, that firearm I was thinking of buying, maybe I'll kind of dial it back a little bit and wait, you know, six months or something like that. And, um, and I also think we see the thing when, when people feel that their rights to buy firearms or own firearms is threatened, that they probably they probably buy ahead. They probably buy guns that they were going to wait on, but because they feel they may not have that opportunity, 
uh, they you know they go out and buy one or two or five or ten or whatever now, and then when they don't feel there's a threat, uh, they may not buy any for a while because they've kind of spent ahead and you know now they need to get back to some uh, normalcy. Gotcha. All right. Um, it's 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 a fascinating dynamic and it's always been observed, you know, throughout the years. Sure. Are there unique challenges to the hunter who uses a firearm versus just the everyday gun owner? Um, I don't think there is on the political side. In fact, I think hunting is is a thing that's probably seen as the most uh, accepted uh, use by a lot of non-gun owners. You know, they understand hunting and uh, you know, as long as they aren't uh, adamantly opposed to hunting, they understand that people use firearms and hunt with. Uh, I think the challenges that hunters are having uh, is not so much related to the firearm as it's related to, you know, access to places to go hunt. Uh, right. And, uh, you know, that, that I think, and you're probably seeing that and hear that from people all the time. Yes. Yeah, it seems to be not so much what I'm going to hunt with, but where I'm going to hunt. I think you're absolutely right. Right. Yep. Okay. Right. Yep. Good point. Let's get, let's talk a little bit about Ruger. Now, Ruger, of course, uh, is in my backyard, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know how vast Ruger is or exactly where all the plants are located or where business is necessarily, but I've always had a good experience with Ruger. My, my friends always talked highly of them, and you know, in the Upper Valley, living up there for a little while, it seemed like we always had access to Ruger somehow. I'm not sure if that's connected to the location of the, the gun manufacturing plant or, whatnot, or not, but um, it just always seemed to be around. Um, let's go through like the birth of, of Ruger. Where did he come from, and and uh, how did he get started? What, what were the origins of Ruger? Well, Mister Ruger was a firearms enthusiast. Uh, he uh, was, uh, you might say, a gun designer at a very early age. I, I've read that he used to hang out in machine shops when he was young, just to you know watch manufacturing processes and such. And, uh, he uh, left college and. Uh, 1939, and uh, because the war was, you know, was coming, you know, he couldn't, uh, I mean, he, he, he got a job at the Springfield Armory, and he uh, was there at the beginning of, of, of World War II, but that really wasn't what he wanted to do. So, you know, he left there, he went to design a uh, machine gun on his own, which he ended up selling to auto ordinance, uh, and uh he wanted to start a gun company, but he first started a company that made uh, hand tools. Okay. And uh, it, it went along for a couple of years and, and uh, didn't really do well and failed. And you know, Then he had the design for, you know, the pistol that really started it all uh, in, in Sturm Ruger was uh, the little twenty two auto pistol. And his neighbor, um, Sturm, who was a uh, uh, family that had some money, and uh, so he invested uh, $50,000 in the business, and that launched Ruger. And the original pistol, uh, which is referred to today as the Mark I, uh, sold for thirty-seven fifty back then. And what year was and this? And they ran, uh, this was in uh, 1949. 1949, all right. Right. And they ran an ad in the American Rifleman, plus they got a good article in the Rifleman, and the uh, orders just started pouring in. And so they would build the guns and ship them. And one of the interesting things about Ruger is um, Ruger has never borrowed any money. Ruger has uh, has uh, paid its own way all the way it's gone along. When it's done expansions, it's paid it out of the, you know their cash reserves. They have never borrowed any money. And back then, when people would send a check in for the gun, they wouldn't cash the check until they shipped that gun. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of been a, been a foundation of Ruger. I mean, that's the way the whole world should work in a lot of ways, right? Well, it, it certainly worked well here. <laughs> right. So, right. Is that still, so, the, you know, it, still the same policy today? It is. We've never brought any money. Uh, I was told once we brought some money just to figure out how to do it, but you know, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you know? gotcha. But, no. It, uh, it is still the same today. We have no debt, and we've never had any debt. So, And then, you know, after that gun, the, the, the rimfire pistol was popular, uh, it was time to move on to something else. And uh, the next gun was the single six, which was a, you know, Western-style twenty two revolver, kind of a downsized, uh, you know, like kind of a, of a, you might say, like the old Peacemaker or something. And one of the things that's been said about Bill Ruger is, he knew what the public wanted before they knew what they wanted. Because back in the 50s, 
everyone was like, well, why would anyone want a single action revolver? You know, Colt had discontinued making single actions because of war manufacturing. They didn't reintroduce the gun after the war. Uh, no one else was really doing it. Well, why would anybody want a single action revolver? Well, it turned out to be very popular. You know, today we make all kinds of single action revolvers. And, um, and, and if you look at other guns over time, and Bill Ruger, the, the number one, the single shot rifle, you know, when that gun came about, it's like, why would anybody want a single shot rifle in a, in a world that we have semi autos and we have good bolt guns and this and that, you know? Right. But they still, you know, they were popular and they're still popular today. So, uh, he, he had a knack for, for knowing what people wanted, and he had a knack, in, you know, in design and manufacturing. Uh, so he could bring a gun into the marketplace at a, at a fair uh, value. And his his contention was that a good rifle should not cost more than a week's salary for a working man. You know, and he, uh, he really okay. was a, a designer and a manufacturer for blue-collar workers. I mean, a, a good gun for a, a, a good value. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um I like that's a that's an interesting theory. You, so the working man should be able to afford it this gun based off of what they made for the week. Right, that was his uh, his theory. Okay. Yeah. What? Why are the guns that are like the single shot still and even single action? Why is that still around today? Is it a tradition or is it is there a utility to it that people are finding? Well, I think there's both. I mean, I think on the single action revolvers. I mean, what made them popular when they were introduced is in the 50s and 60s, there were a lot of Westerns on television. Right. And, you know, and so I think there was some carryover there. I think today, uh, single actions are popular in, you know, two or three different categories. Uh, in the big bores, the single action handguns are popular for hunting. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, the 454 Casul, the 480 Ruger, the 44 Magnum, uh, you know, those are all good hunting calibers and single actions. I think the, the guns like the Vaqueros, you know, those are popular because we have SAS, we have the Single Action Shooting Society, we have some other, the, you know, the, the old West type cowboy sports. So, I mean, those are really popular there. And I think for some people, it's just almost like, feel like they own a little piece of history, you know, that right. having one of the kind of the old style handguns. Right. Yeah. I think that the history and the tradition is always something you kind of want to hold on to. It kind of makes you feel yeah. like you're part of America. And I think in the single action rifles, like the number one, I, you know, they're definitely very utilitarian. I mean, I've taken the number one to Africa several times. And, and uh, when you first show up in a camp and they look at you, you got a number one rifle, they're kind of like, hey, I don't know about this guy. But, you know, if you can shoot, uh, one shot is what it does. And if you can run a number one and run it well, uh, you're really not in a handicap. I, I had a, an instructor at one of the professional hunter schools in South Africa tell me one time that in their shooting skills course that they have in their school, the best time ever recorded was done with a number one rifle. Really? Which which I found interesting. He said the uh, the guy carried his uh, extra ammo and an epaulette on his shoulder, and he just re- you know reached up, dropped him in, and he said it was uh, the guy obviously knew what he was doing. <laughs> right. Oh, fascinating. Very cool. So. Mr. Ruger started Ruger. He got a, a mail order catalog sort of going, to, um, made it somewhat su- successful, didn't borrow any money, um, had some plans on who he was selling this to. Obviously, his target market was the common worker, um, sounds like, and he was selling guns. Now, this is this is now the f- uh, late 40s, early 50s that this is all occurring. Yes, yeah. Right. company was started in 49. The, uh, the single six, I think, was introduced, I want to say 52 or 53. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, they started in what was been known as the old Red Barn, which was a building in Southport, Connecticut, where the company started. And, okay. And and then in 1959, they they kind of ran out of room, so they moved into a, a larger building there in Southport, which is still the corporate headquarters today. Okay. And uh, and then they added on to that plant, and then in 1960 they built the plant in Newport, New Hampshire, the one where I uh, work now. Yes. And uh, and uh, that. Still today is the largest manufacturing facility that Ruger has. We have two other manufacturing facilities in the country, but that's the largest one. That's the largest one. And that is where, you know, pine tree casting, which is the the, the casting side of the business. And, yeah. and that's one of the things that, that made Ruger a little different, too. You know, where a lot of companies are doing um, forging, uh, Ruger, from the very beginning, started casting. And, and, it's, and that's a pretty unique process when you, when you see it happen. Basically, you have... Uh, um, forms that, that give you wax molds of what the finished piece is going to look like. And you'll have, uh, say it's a frame for a single action revolver, you know, you'll have a what they call a tree that'll have maybe a dozen or so of these 
of the frames on there. Uh, they go through a process where they, they basically dip them in a slurry and sand, and they build a ceramic around all that. And then when that is, uh, has been cured, they run it through a furnace and melt all the wax out of it, and then they take it into the foundry and they pour you know molten metal into that. Hmm. And uh, and then when that's all done, they break the, 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 the ceramic off, break the mold off, and you have your, you know, your rough cast pieces there, and then they get machined. And, and actually, you can be pretty pretty uh, close to, to finish uh, uh, dimensions with the casting process. I mean, it's really, it can be very, very accurate. So it, it's, a, it's a whole different process. Uh, no one else had ever used it to that point. And uh, it was one of the things that allowed Ruger to be competitive in the marketplace. Gotcha. Oh, that's fascinating. And this was the the mid '60s that this started, right? At '63, the uh, the, the uh, Pine Tree Casting Company was okay. founded up here in Newport, yeah, up in New Hampshire. Got it. Right. Right. So, where did the company go from there after the, the, during the '60s? And what kind of challenges <laughs> were you facing? Well, the uh, Probably the biggest, I, I, in my mind, one of the biggest things that came out of the 60s was 1964, they introduced the 1022, which is, you know, basically the rimfire rifle in, in my rimfire autoloader. I mean, we've built somewhere oh, yeah. north of 7 million of those over the years, you know. And uh, so, I mean, that, that was that was a pretty major event. It certainly uh, made the name Ruger uh, a standard household item in a lot of places. And, uh, you know, the number one was introduced in the 60s. The, the M77 rifles came along uh, in 69. And uh, and then the double action revolvers, uh, you know, we started doing those in the 60s. So uh, it uh, that was a pretty major, you know, major time frame when things really kind of got rolling there. And uh, gotcha. as we w- moved into the 70s, you know, then we uh, the Mini 14 came along, which is certainly one of the, another pretty classic gun uh in the Ruger line, and and then uh, the red label shotguns came along in the '70s. Yeah, you know, and then uh, you know, moving on in the '80s, we got into the big board double action handguns, you know, the Red Hawks, and and you know, the first 44 Magnums in the Ruger lineup and such. And then also in in the '70s or in the '80s, uh, they opened the plant in Prescott, Arizona. And uh, yeah. today, that's where all the the uh, pistols, all the auto loading pistols, are made. Uh, whether they're rimfire or center fire, they're all made in Arizona. Gotcha. Fascinating. So that brings us up to present day, basically. Yeah, it, in uh, you know, I guess going back in the you know in the nineties, they they closed all the manufacturing down in the Southport plant, and everything was either at the Prescott plant or up here at the Newport plant. Uh, you know, there were some, I guess I'd call them modernizations or redesigns of some of the products. You know, the original Mark One went through a Mark Two phase and then into a Mark Three phase, and and such like that. And uh, you know the uh, 480 cartridge was introduced back in that time frame and such. And, and uh, you know, so there's, there's been, uh, been a lot of things that have happened. As we got into the 2000s, there have been a lot of changes. And we had some uh, changes in uh, in the company in terms of the Rugers. Uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, the Rugers pretty much uh, left the company. And, and uh, you know, the, the executive staff and such has been non-Ruger since then. And uh, Mr. Pfeiffer, Mr. Michael Pfeiffer, came on board, and I think it was 2006. And he's been... Uh, a very positive influence on the company. I mean, he's. Okay. Uh, uh, I think one of the things that has helped Ruger in recent years is just all the new products that we've come out with. And uh, Mr. Pfeiffer is a big believer that you have to keep coming up with new products, and that's what drives sales. Like he says, you need to give people a reason to buy another gun. And uh, and so there's been a lot of you know new things that have come along since then. I mean, we you know we're in the AR business with the SR series guns. Sure. We're, you know, we we uh, had the the uh, uh, SR9, SR40, SR45 pistols, the first uh, striker fired polymer frame pistols that Ruger did, you know, all came along in that mid 2000 time frame. And, uh, you know, the American rifle series, uh, they were introduced a few years ago. I mean, they're, you know, just, they are great rifles. I mean, they're, they're a work, again, a working man's rifle. They're not fancy. They're, you know, synthetic stocks, but they are a great design. They are accurate. They're just unbelievable. I've taken one of those to Africa a couple of, I think the last trip, or I was, the second to last trip I was over there, I had a Notch 6 in the American, and uh, there were three of us that used that rifle. We took eight animals with eight shots, mm. you know. No uh, kidding. So, oh, wow. Eight animals, eight shots. That's crazy. Yeah, everything from about 80 yards to 300 plus, you know. Wow. And, uh, it, uh, they're, they're just great rifles, and they're really a value for the money. Tell me uh, more about the American rifle. What, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? Well, it's it's a 
basic rifle. It's an all new design. I mean, it, it was uh, the engineers were given the, uh, the uh, task of sitting down and coming up with a new rifle that uh, was a quality gun, that was an accurate gun, that was an affordable gun. And, uh, you know, they did this from the time they sat down with a blank sheet of paper until we were producing guns was under a year, which is just almost phenomenal in this industry. Uh, it has been a very popular product. Uh, it is, there's several variations of it now. Uh, we make left hand and right hand. We make full size guns. We make compacts in a, a number of calibers. Just in the, like the last year or so, we've introduced some magnum calibers in us. We have uh, 300 Win Mag, 7 mm, and, and uh, recently 338 Win Mag. Uh, and uh, it's just uh, it's a really popular gun. And uh, the people that have used it hunting with it. Uh, you know, have just been, I, I, I only have to say they've been astonished at what what it delivers for the price. Gotcha. Uh, and I sure like them. I've have, uh, let's just say I've bought more than one. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine that you've bought more than one. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Uh, so what were the some of the biggest challenges that Ruger faced from the 40s on? Were there any, any, any uh, stories that stuck out that, you know, th- things weren't looking so good? Well, I think it's always been a little uh, cyclical. Uh, again, part of it's politics. Obviously, we've got in the you know 80s and 90s. There's been some challenges there. Um, I think economy has driven part of it over the years. Uh, you know, a firearm is pretty much a discretionary purchase for most people. And so, when when times have been tight, you know, it may be a little harder for a family to justify buying another firearm. And there's a lot of competition out there. I mean, besides all the old names that's been around, there's been a lot of uh, newcomers to the to the industry, especially when you get into the AR market and some of the pistols and such like that. I mean, everybody's building the 1911 these days, and you know, we we waited a hundred years before we got into the business, but uh, right, it's. Uh, right. You know, I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of competition out there, and I think that, you know, the biggest challenge a person I mean, that the company like this has always had is, is uh, you know, selling your product, your idea of your product, the value of your product, the quality of your product to the consumer. Um, and, and there are consumers out there that, you know, are Ruger fans or they're Smith fans or the Colt fans, just like you got Chevy fans and Ford fans, you know, but, but um, you... Uh, you want to reach out and expand your market, so you uh, have to come up with things that make people take a second look at you. Gotcha. Yeah, I think innovation is always key to keeping your brand alive. Um, yes. What um, What's your number one bestseller of all time? In In the years that I've been here, you know, like when the Scout Rifle came out, it was just really a phenomenon. I mean, the Scout Rifle really caught on big time when we introduced that. Uh, the LCP, you know, the little three eighty pistol. I mean, that that changed the whole small gun world, I think. Uh, you know, we came up with one that was reliable and affordable, and uh, we were blamed for the total lack of 3D ammunition being available because everybody was buying guns and everybody wanted ammo. And, and uh, But it drove... Uh, you know, it drove development of ammunition. I mean, there's been a whole lot of new, improved ammo that has come out for the 380s in the last decade or so. Uh, it also it also enticed a lot of other people to get into the 380 market with uh, with you know with, with small, affordable guns. So you know, you can kind of be a trendsetter sometimes. You, if you're successful with something, people pay attention and uh, and uh, you know try and follow suit. If you had to put a caliber on the deer hunting world, which would be your ideal caliber? Well, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I've, outside of using some of the newer calibers that we have for different things, I've kind of been a 30 ox six guy for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've, uh, I've I told people, I said, when I grew up in North Dakota, if you had a 30 ox six, you had a big rifle. And, uh, <laughs> right. you know, there was still a lot of people hunting with 30 thirties and, uh, you know, even older lever guns and such like that. And, uh, I said, nowadays I used to talk to people, I you know they want 300 wind mags and seven MMs. And even one recently when he said, I need a 338 wind mag. And I don't think the deer are getting any stronger, or any more powerful. I think we've, sometimes we've kind of lost the, uh, we've kind of lost the rifleman mentality, you know, yeah. uh, and, uh, but I think there's, you can do an awful lot with a 30 out six. I do too. Um, that's what I use actually. What's your favorite, yeah. what's your favorite overall? Oh, it depends on what I'm trying to do. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, recently I've been spending a lot of time with the 6.5 Creedmoor. I've got one of the Ruger precision rifles in 6.5. And you know, like I said earlier, every time I get a rifle, I like to sit down and work up loads and, you know, find the one that works. And I have found a load for that rifle that I've got two, 
five shot group shot at a hundred yards and they're just one ragged hole. Wow. And, uh, so I'm pretty happy with that. You know? like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, know. that's a good group. <laughs> yeah. Um, very interesting. Um, tell me a little bit more about Bill Ruger. Are there any uh, stories that stick out in your head about what he was like? Well, I never knew Bill personally, Bill Sr. Um, I understand, you know, he, he ran the company and everybody knew he ran the company. But he was a genius when it came to firearms. And obviously he ran He knew how to run a very successful company. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, over the years, when you look back at really his legacy and, you know, what he's able to accomplish, and like I said, you know, really bring a fairly new company that was founded 100 to 150 years after some of the competitors uh, and really make it a, a driving force. You know, it's, it's a man on a mission and it's a man that knew what he was doing. Gotcha. Where is the company going to go from here? Well, I think it's going to continue to be a successful company. I, it's... Uh, you know, we've, we're doing a lot of things today that, uh, you know, work towards that end. Uh, we do a lot of things that we have a voice of a customer program, which uh, we go out and solicit input from people. You know, it's, I think there used to be time in the industry when companies would design and build a gun and put it out there and tell people this is what you want, and it wasn't always what you wanted. And I think today that's especially true. There's a lot of competition, a lot of people making quality products. So, you know, what Ruger instigated this, this, uh, Voice of the Customer program probably a decade ago or so, and you know when we we'll go out and we'll ask people, you know, where is there a hole in the in the market? Where, where's there a category that's not being serviced? Or if once that's been determined, it's just, so what does that product need to be? You know, what what would you like to see in that product? The LCP was a gun that came out of that process. You know, the little 380. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I think the end result is that when you do bring the product to market, you have something people have told you they want. So I think that's a very positive thing. You know, the other thing we've done is a lot of changes in our manufacturing plants. You know, we've gone to lean manufacturing. We've uh, gone to you know, really the process of eliminating waste, and it's like a waste of product, wasted time, you know, all kinds of things that are really add no value to the product in the end. So we work really hard to do that. A lot of new machinery, a lot of new designs. Uh, we've added a lot of, of new talent on the engineering side over the last decade. Uh, you know, again, if new product is going to drive things, and you have to have people in there working on those and putting those together, or, you know, and designing those. So, right. and you know, and those people are there, and and they're always working on the next whatever. I mean, there's there's, you know, we have a a process of uh, of development and uh, go through meetings uh, periodically, and you know, where are we on this product? Where are we on that product? And, we have an area we call the parking lot where there's all the things that are waiting to get to, all the things that, you know, down the road we'll do. So um, lots of good things coming in that way. And I, I think it's uh, there's a lot of uh, people in the company that are shooters. That certainly helps. Um, you know, the, the Ruger Precision Rifle was designed by one of the engineers that is a long-range shooter. And, you know, he basically put everything in that rifle that he wanted to see in a rifle. And so, you know, we've got a rifle that comes to the market probably in real-world price, you know, somewhere between 1000 and $1,200 that you put. You couldn't build it for three thousand if you're going to go out and build it from scratch, and it's it competes with them. It's right up there, you know, competing with with anybody at this building uh, and shooting custom rifles. So gotcha. when you have when you have people that are passionate about what they're doing, and they you know put that to work every day, you put out products that uh, the shooters want. Now, as far as uh, and there must have been some failures along the way. Are there any products that started out into development that were never brought to market? You know, one that I've heard about was after the Mini 14 was built, of course, that, that's chambered in 223, you know, there was an effort to do uh, a 308 version, you know, something like the, basically like the M14. And, yeah. uh, you know, there were some built and they just, uh, for whatever reason, they uh, they just never made it to the marketplace. Uh, you know, and we've had some things that have gone away for one reason or another. Sometimes things will go away because it, there isn't a lot of demand out there. Obviously, when you have, you know, somewhat limited manufacturing. I mean, you, when you're busy building everything you can build, selling everything you build, um, if you got a product that uh, starts sitting on the shelf, maybe it's time to move on to something else. Right. So, uh, you know, there's things like that. that uh, but, yeah, there, there's been some things over time. There's been some things that uh, you've know, never seen the light of day and no one ever heard about, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of part of the process. Gotcha. Has, has there ever been a time where you wanted to, to go back to uh, an old firearm and maybe revamp it and bring it forth to a modern generation? Oh, we've done that. You know, we, we are constantly taking a look at products. I think the Vaqueros are an example. You know, the original Vaqueros were a larger frame. 
uh, that, that we have today and back about, uh, I don't know what it was, 2003, 2004, somewhere in there, I think it was, we came out with the new generation of Vaqueros and they're, you know, they're downsized a little bit. They're, they're really the size of the original, you know, Colts, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, a different frame, uh, grip frame and such. So they're, they have the feel of, you know, all the old original six guns out there. And, uh, that was a very important move, I think, because it, uh, it just got back a little bit more, uh, you know, to, to what the original guns were like. And, and if you're going to have a piece of history, let's make it as close to the, to the history as we can. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very cool. Well, Ken, I, I'd like to move on to our, one of our favorite segments of the show. And that's, uh, listen to you tell us a really good deer story. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I, I asked you well, in the pre-show Chad, if you could think of a memorable one. Well, I, I have to probably my best, and, and, I, and people don't believe me on this sometimes, but, uh, I did have a couple of witnesses, so, but uh, when I was I was handgun hunting uh, in Wyoming mule deer, and uh, we were actually we were putting a stock on a deer we'd seen. Uh, we're kind of working our way around to get uh, downwind of them, and we come up on this ridge, and the, the guy just look up, and there's like four nice bucks out on this the other side of the ridge, kind of out on the, this little flat area. So, you know, I took uh, threw my backpack on the ground, got on top, I took a shot, um, and uh, I hit this animal, but I hit it too far back, and uh, it ran off up the hill and it stopped again. And it was a long ways. And I thought, well, I got nothing to lose here. I mean, uh, if I, uh, you know, I, I, if we don't get it here, we're going to end up spending the day tracking this thing and such. And so I took another shot, and I actually hit behind it. I go, what in the world's going on here? And so I held off the nose of the animal. And why I even thought of doing this, I don't know. But I held off the nose of the animal fired around and put it right through the lungs and it stood there 20 seconds and rolled down the hill. Um, so in retrospect, I mean, what I realized, I just come from a writer's conference where I had that gun. I let people shoot it and somebody had adjusted the scope for me and I didn't, we, you know, we'd gotten in late at night and had ahead of time to shoot and sight it in. So I learned a valuable lesson there. Always go to the range and sight it in. Um, but the thing that was remarkable about it is, the first shot was at 140 yards, and the second shot was about 200 yards for wow. the 44 Magnum. And so the guy turns to me and he says, so what's so hard about this handgun hunting stuff? And I said, <laughs> you know, I said, honestly, I never should have taken the first shot. It was almost like a buck fever. There it was. Let's do it, you know. I said, I never should have taken the first shot. But once I did, we had nothing to lose to try and make the second one count, you yeah. know. Gotcha. So that was that – was, uh, I think that was probably one of my favorite deer hunting stories. Cause it, it, it was back when I was doing a lot of handgunning, and you, you uh, I guess back then I, I, uh, I don't know. I was just I, I wanted to be good at it, and so I worked at it. Do, do you have a favorite game that you like to hunt? Um, I've hunted a lot in Africa. I've been to Africa I think it's eleven times, hmm. and uh, I like African hunting. It's not so much a favorite species. I just like the way they hunt in Africa, where you walk a lot and you. And you look at a lot of game and such, and uh, and I just like the fact that there's a lot of game, there's a lot of species there. Lot to look uh, at, you know, in other words. Lot to look at. Yeah, I, I went to Australia a few years ago to hunt water buffalo over there. I enjoyed the trip, but what I realized for the first day or two is like, there's something missing. What's going on? There's something missing here. I don't, I don't get it. And then finally, I realized, well, there aren't all the other animals. You basically you have water buffalo, and that's, you know, that's it. Right. That's what we're looking for. And you know, the thing in Africa is you may be hunting kudu, but you're going to see gimsbuck and warthogs and zebras and giraffes and you, you're gonna see all kinds of stuff and right i i just find that uh, i don't know it's just fascinating that well, makes the day go by pretty pretty quickly i would think because you've got so much to look at so, right so many interesting different uh species of animals just showing up and every time exactly. you see something like that it's just another piece of the puzzle yeah. and very so it's always entertaining i mean it's never a dull moment it is yeah. And, it, and it's if you have a good pH, it's also very educational because he can tell you a lot of things about the animals and this and that. It, it's right. uh, it's really interesting. Every time I come back, it's like you know I, I know more than than when I you know, left. Yeah. Uh, so I find that enjoyable. I think for North American species, I love hunting hogs. <laughs> I mean, oh yeah, I mean, right. I love hunting hogs, whether it's a rifle or a handgun. I, I love hunting hogs. But I think in terms of of uh, you know game animal, I. I haven't done it a lot, but I do enjoy antelope. They're, they can be a challenge. Gotcha. Very you know? interesting. And, 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 of course, my, 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 my really favorite hunting of all, though, is still just pheasant hunting. Right. Of course. But, of course. That would make know. sense. <laughs> yep. Going back to your roots there, I would imagine, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And it's it's social. You're with friends, and it's it just I really enjoy feather hunting. Gotcha. I'd like to kind of turn the mic over to Dusty here for just a little bit because I'm I'm curious about what a guy like you uh, who carries uh, you know one of the fi- finest firearms made in the world uh, in hunts all over the world. What do you bring into the into the field with you? We always like to kind of go through your backpack and see what kind of things you bring with you. So I'd like to turn the, turn it over to Dusty here for a little bit. Okay. Yeah, tell us, uh, are you carrying a backpack into the woods? Uh, I do. I mean, I usually always have one on the truck. Like in Africa, you spend a lot of time driving and looking yes. and then, you know, you know, just stalking and stuff. So I always got a pack on the truck and it's got, uh, you know, it's got water and it's got snacks and it's got rain gear and it's got a sweater or a vest and, and uh, you know, a little bit of area compass and, and uh I don't know. Offhand, right now, I always got a good first aid kit. I've learned that over the years, man. You, you got to have a good first aid kit. You got to have, I say, some of your favorite drugs. I mean, just in terms of, uh, you know, things for stomach upset and and you know all this and that. And I've learned that over the years, especially in Africa. I've had two or three incidents where, like a friend of my, mine used to say, I felt like I was going to die. I was afraid I wasn't going to. Um, you know, just. Uh, just have kind of the bases covered, and every time you go, you learn something new, you know, what to throw in and what they have with you and such. And I know somewhere I have a list that I've had a lot of people in the office that have had opportunities now to go hunt Africa, and they'll come to me and say, well, what should we take? So I've got a, I've got a whole, here's what you ought to have, you know, list for people and such. You know, things like, uh, you know, make sure you take a good sunblock and insect repellent and eyeglass repair kit, you know, just stuff like that, because there are no Walmarts to run to. All right, makes sense though. Yeah, for sure. You know, yeah, big roll of duct tape. Let's tell talk a little bit about uh, some of your gear. Tell us what your favorite camouflage to wear in the woods is. You know, I don't wear much camouflage. Uh, most of the things I've hunted, it really isn't necessary. I'm when you hunt in Africa, they really like like to have you wear, you know, kind of a darker colors, you know, greens or browns or something like that. So I've kind of got a wardrobe doing that. Over the years, we've done a lot of television and since they want you to wear the same thing every day, no matter how many days you're filming. I usually have at least three of everything that I've, you know, bought to wear hunting. Uh, so I wear a lot of, uh, a lot of green primarily when I'm on hunting. Gotcha. Any particular boots that you would wear in the African terrain? I have worn a couple different kinds of boots over there quite a bit. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, boot that is made exclusively for Cabela's. I've worn, I actually, I got a couple pairs of those and I've worn them a lot over there. But then um, I, I've, I've got a, I've got a bad ankle. In fact, I've had a couple back surgeries. So I've had some weakness in a, in a leg and a bad ankle. So a few years ago or a couple of years ago, I ended up buying a, a higher pair of boots. The ones that I've been wearing before were pretty much just ankle length. It's, it's hot over there. One thing I did find on my first trip to Africa is I really overdressed. Uh, I had, um, boots that were, you know, too heavy and hot and I had a lot of clothing that was too heavy and hot. So, kind of you know dial that back a little bit and uh they, they are just they're just a dynamite boot to wear very good tell us uh firearm tell us what firearm you're carrying when you're going on an african safari hunt it depends on what i'm hunting i uh 375 ruger um i've carried a you know for cape buffalo or i guess i've done some other games just because they were they were opportunity while i was hunting buffalo and so it's just sable and things like that so you know the 375 Ruger has just been really a go-to rifle for me when I'm when I'm not sure how big a game I'm going to have to handle. And even places where sometimes you're hunting smaller plains game, you may be an area where you're going to have um, lion or buffalo or something like that. So you know, having a larger caliber is certainly not uh, you know not not a downside to it. I've done a lot of hunting over there with a thirty out six, a number one and thirty out six. I probably have really have taken more animals with that rifle than anything else. And I've done uh, a fair amount with uh, uh, the uh, Ruger 300 RCM, you know, the Ruger Compact Magnum. When you go for an ammunition, do you, do you load your own rounds to head over there, or what? Tell us about that. No, I use factory ammo when I'm hunting, and I've almost exclusively used Hornady ammo. Uh, you know, we've I've done a lot of hunting for our television shows over the years, and other people, and because you use what your sponsors do. But I've always been the I've always used a lot of Hornady ammo anyway, and, uh, you know, for guns like the 375 Ruger and the, and the RCMs, I mean, they were the only manufacturer of that ammo early on, and I just got uh, used to using it and got my guns sighted in with it and uh, just stayed with that. Gotcha. Do you notice a, a 
shot uh, pattern difference if you switch ammos, or does it make that much difference? Um, what you'll notice usually, if anything, is well, first of all, I think I think every rifle likes something better than than other things for the most part. I mean, it's one of the reasons I sit down and work up lows. I mean, it really comes down to uh, like when when we came out with the scout rifle, I must have loaded a dozen loads and sat down and, and shot them until I found one that was I really liked. And you know what you would see is your group open up and then close up and open up, and it all has to do with the barrel harmonics. But what what I've seen in using different factory ammos is, you know, for the most part, they all work quite well. You may see your group move. If, if you've sighted in with one ammo and you shoot another one, you may see your group move a little bit or something. I, I, I've rarely seen groups get really bad. You know, it, it may open up a little bit, but, I, you know, I, I, when I'm sometimes when I'm shooting like my precision rifle, I get, you know, really focused on these really nice tight groups. But I've always kind of felt that if I can put everything, uh, you know, in a, in a six inch paper plate when I'm, when I'm practicing, that's going to do the job when I'm out there. And so I've never, I can't recall a case where I really had anything that, that really gave me a, you know, a lot of heartburn over not delivering uh, good groups for, for hunting. Right on. Uh, as much as you shoot, let's talk a little bit about your shooting practices. How, how do you go, let's say we've got a, uh, a T bench shooters bench set up to, are you shooting off a lead sled or something that, uh, gives you the pinpoint accuracy that you're looking for? No, I'm usually, uh, I'm either shooting off a bipod on the bench. I'll put down a, uh, uh, on the concrete bench, like the, the range I shoot at a lot has concrete benches, um, and I will I will put down a uh, like a backpacker pad on that just to give me a little cushion between the the bipod and the bench. And I'll use sandbags at the back, uh, or else I'll go prone. You know, and I, I've uh, done some shooting. There's a I've done quite a bit at, at gun sites, but that's been mostly handgun, a little bit of rifle. But there's a a really great shooting school in Texas called FTW. Uh, they do long range shooting. You know, we've shot there a uh, thousand yards and beyond, uh, and you know they've taught me a lot about you know going prone and getting steady and such. And, and of course, you know when you're hunting, going prone isn't always a possibility because grass and this and that and such. But still, a lot of the basics, kind of building a you know a good solid structure to to uh, you know use the gun. And one of the things that I've learned from hunting in Africa is over there you use shooting sticks all the time. Uh, and so I really uh, do that a lot. I'll carry shooting sticks even when I'm hunting, you know, over here now, and, and uh, use those whether I'm in a sitting position and you know have them down low, or you get up higher, and, or if you can lean against a tree, or you know whatever. I mean, it, it's to me, it's just really important to get really good and solid, and and anything you can do to help you do that is a positive. Awesome. Just touching base a little bit. Uh, you talked like you've been to shooting school. Is that uh, something that? Uh, was a valuable asset to your shooting skills? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've learned so much. I mean, on the handgun side, uh, I've done a number of classes at gun site and at Thunder Ranch, and I learned, you know, just a tremendous amount about handgun shooting. And not only just the mechanics of handgun shooting, but, I mean, just just all the things that make you better, that make you, uh, I don't know, I want to say more fluid almost. You know, it, it's the old... In fact, like one of the instructors once said, you know, I want to teach you, this is in self-defense style, but his, his thing was, I want to teach you to run your firearm so well that if you ever end up having to use it, you're not thinking about your firearm, you're thinking about tactics or how to get out of here or whatever, you know. So I think that's part of it. You shoot it a lot, and, you know, and, and you do drills where you had malfunction and you had to clear them and you had to do that, you know, so just, just so you really get intimate with that firearm and know how to, know how it to make it work without thinking about it. On the long gun side, I mean, I just learned a lot about you know, all those, you know, basically just good position with the gun, how to get behind the rifle, how to how to get solid, you know, breath control, hold the trigger. You know, one of the things I see a lot of people do, and I used to do, is pull the trigger and immediately let go of the trigger. And one of the things they taught us in one of the schools is pull the trigger and hold it until you're back looking through the scope and, you know, looking at your target again and then release the trigger. And it's just all these little nuances. And this one school I've attended quite a bit, the one in Texas, the FTW, you know, their two primary instructors are former SEALs. And they're guys that, you know, they know their way around a firearm. And, and uh, you know, we're doing this long-range shooting that, uh, you know, I mean, a two to 300-yard shot's a pretty close shot in a lot of that. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's just you know, getting the basics down. And then in that kind of thing, it's just the big key is learning to read the wind. Um uh, you know, when you uh, when you go to school with them and you take your rifle and you have your ammo, they'll help you build a range card 
you know, out to 700 or 1,000 yards. And I use mill dot scopes a lot, uh, and so you can dial them up and dial them down and such. So really, long-range shooting is, is kind of mathematics except for the wind. Um, and, boy, that can be tricky. <laughs> Talk a little. Like, let's touch base a little bit about the wind. What what, what kind of knowledge do you have, and, and kind of run through some of what you've learned when you're shooting the wind? Well, one of the first things you have to realize is what the wind is doing where you are may not be the same as what the wind's doing halfway to your target or at your target. So, you know, you kind of you want to take a look and and see what will give you an idea. Is, is are the leaves on the trees waving? Is the grass waving? Is there a little dust here and there? You know, really, what's going on? What what can give you a clue? There's a first of all what the wind's doing out there, and secondly, how strong is it? And they'll teach you little things like, you know, if the leaves are moving, it's it's you know so much, and maybe you know eight miles an hour. If this is happening, if the whole tree's moving, it's more. You know, so you have all these little clues that you that you look at and you try and figure out what it is. And uh, but I think the thing that that has really been an eye opener to me a couple times at FTW on the long ranges, like the thousand yard ranges, we have popped smoke like three different places on the range, and it's amazing because the smoke near you may be going right to left and halfway down it's going straight up and all the way down it's going left to right and then you know or it's it's going up and then it's it's going left to right and, and so. Um, you know, that just has a huge influence on what you're doing. And I have a lot to learn about reading the wind. I mean, we've done a little bit and we've worked a little bit. I love to go back and spend a week just, you know, just trying to read the wind. And the thing I like about their place is it's not, you know, it's not just a set range. You do a drive around course at their place. They have, you know, probably two or three dozen places you shoot from that ranges from, you know, a couple hundred out to 1400 yards. And, you know, they're all different. They have a lot of canyons and a lot of this. The wind comes out of those canyons and, you know, over the rises and this and that. So it's not like if you shoot on the same range every day and you know at 2 o'clock the wind's always coming, you know, right to left at, you know, 9 miles an hour. That's not the case there. It's it's different every time you're there. Well, that makes sense, though, you know. It, uh, a whole lot of variables play in uh, shooting the wind, and it's something that uh... – you know, I think that a lot of uh, long-range hunters should further further educate themselves on. Yeah, well, and that's their goal out there because they run what they call the Sportsman's All Weather All Terrain Shooting School for Hunters, and and their ultimate goal is to teach you to be confident in making a shot twice as far as you think you're going to have to shoot when you hunt, so that when you come to making that 300-yard shot you know you've made a 600 yards hit on steel you know the basics that go into that so you have the confidence to make that, that you know that longer shot i mean they're not you know they're not promoting long distance shooting for hunting they're not like some of the people we've seen out there that you know want the game to run farther away so they can prove they can hit it a lot farther away you know they're they still are you know you need to do your job and you need to you know, be efficient and, and, you know, get a good one shot kill, but they want to teach you the skills that make that happen. That's very good. Very good. Very cool. Ned, you, you got a lot of knowledge in there. Well, I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of great people and know a whole lot more than I do. And I just try to absorb as much as I can and put it into practice. And, you know, I think one of the things about, about wind is, you know, it's almost like the second level is learning to read it. The first level is just even being aware you guys need to think about it. I mean, I think a lot of people shoot and never think about the wind. Uh, and uh, it's amazing, uh, you know, what the wind will do. I know the first time I hit a target at 1,000 yards uh, with a 300 wind mag, uh, I bet I was 15 feet off the target to the side. You know, 15 feet high and 15 feet off the target. And that's dropped the bullet in to hit the target, you know, I mean, it was, wow. it was so far away. I didn't have enough dial up on my scope. So, I mean, you had to kind of, you had to, you know, hold over and you had to hold into the wind. And that's what those guys are so good. I mean, if you're, if you're on the gun and they're calling wind for you, you know, they'll tell you, you know, say you're shooting at a 12 inch plate at 400 yards. They'll tell you, you know, hold halfway to the edge, hold to the edge, you know, hold halfway to the edge, hold off the edge. You know I mean? They're, they're it's constantly changing. These guys are so good. They can call it second to second. Wow. That's amazing. That's intense. It is. Yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Ken, I want to get into the 10 rapid-fire questions here. Before I do, I just, just just wanted to run this by you. If I'm looking to buy a firearm, what are some of the things that we should consider as a, a buyer uh, when trying to choose uh, the quality, the, the best quality gun that we can put our hands on, regardless of money? Are you, are you, are you thinking handgun, long gun? Long, uh, right, you know, hunting guns. 
Raw hunting gun, okay. Well, I, I think one of the first things you need to do is really decide what caliber you're going to need because I think people people can, can, I don't know, buy too much gun and then they don't like shooting it, it hurts, and they don't want to practice. And if you don't practice, you're never going to be maybe good at it. So, and I think practice is really important, whether it's a handgun or a long gun. Hmm. You need to practice to get good at it, get comfortable at it. Um, I think in terms of, of you know, how to pick that gun, obviously pick it up, feel it, does it fit you? Uh, hopefully you can dry fire it, see if you like the trigger, what's going on there. Um, is the length of pull right? Uh, if you're going to put a scope on it, you know, are you going to are you going to get your cheek a good cheek weld with it? Do you need to put a pad on the gun to you know to get to get a good cheek weld so you're looking through the scope the same every time? Um, and then you know, there's so much information out there today with the internet and everything. Is you know, check it out, see what people say about them and such, and ask around some of your friends that that have some knowledge. And I, I think a lot of, uh, for especially first-time gun buyers, uh, you know, should get input from from people, get the input from their friends and such. And, you know, you may have a friend that you know is a dyed-in-the-wool, you know, brand X or something. And sometimes it's like, okay, take that with a grain of salt. But if you got you know people that have handled a lot of different guns and this and that. Um, you know, just listen to them. But in the end, hopefully you can get a chance to shoot a gun similar to what you're looking at and get a feel for that and, and such. And and then, you know, once you get the gun, you need to, uh, I feel it, you need to, uh, you know, probably buy, well, I was going to say two or three or four boxes of different brands of ammo and, uh, and and go out and see how your gun handles that load, what, what it likes best. And when you find the one it likes best, stick with that. Okay. Gotcha. One other question, and it's just a soft top of my head. Can you overshoot a gun? Like, can you wear out a barrel? Oh, yes. You can. You can. And have you, you got to shoot a lot. And it depends on what you're shooting. But, you know, some of these new hot rounds, some of the magnums and such, yeah, you can shoot a barrel out if you're shooting a lot. Okay. Uh, you know, but, but, I mean, I've talked to our engineers about that. I mean, there are some calibers out there that are telling me you can shoot a barrel out, in, you know, a thousand rounds or less. Interesting. Um, you know, and, okay. and uh, you know, if you're an active shooter, I mean, if you're just, if you're putting two rounds, uh, getting your gun prepped to go hunt every fall, and you're firing two rounds while you're hunting, you're never going to wear a gun out. But, you know, um, I mean, I've gone to the range, and, you know, well, I, at one time, my son and I, when the Scout rifle came out, uh, we went to the range, and I think between the two of us, you put 600 rounds of 308 through two rifles in an afternoon. Uh, you know, you do yeah. that a lot, that, you know, that can wear things right. out. You know? right. And what do you what do you do then? You just, you, you got to go buy a new barrel and, and have a re-outfit? Or... Uh, what I would, I mean, it, uh, you can send them back to the factory. They'll replace a barrel. I mean, Ruger will replace a barrel for you. Okay. Um, you know, launch the gun with that we still have parts for. And we have parts for most. I mean, some things go away. Well, there's a lot of custom gunsmiths out there. There's a lot of companies that make aftermarket barrels, too. And, you know, you uh, you may decide you want to upgrade to a, you know, to a custom barrel. Uh, sometimes it makes a difference. Sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, I, I mean, if you got a rifle you really like and you feel it's... Uh, you know, like some of these guys that are shooting a lot of varmints, you're shooting the 204 or even a 223 or something. You can shoot a barrel out. If you've gone out and fired a couple thousand rounds a summer on something like that, and you do that three or four years in a row, you probably need to be looking at, you know, checking your barrel out. Gotcha. All right. And just finally, what about just basic gun care? What do you what do you need to do to, to make sure your firearm's going to last a long time, other than not shooting the barrel out? Just clean it. Keep it clean. Um if you're out and it's you know windy and grungy, just you know keep, keep it clean, keep it dry. If you're if you're uh, hunting in uh, you know wet weather, you know make sure you're wiping it down. Even in camp at night, if you're you know wipe it down, you know take a boar snake or something and pull it through there and keep it dry. Keep it lube, but don't over lube them. I mean, people can over lube guns too much, and all that does is attract and hold all the garbage, holds the carbon, and holds the all the stuff that you don't want in there. So, you know, be judicious about how much you lube something. Right. Uh, but the bottom line is just keep it clean, and you know, when you get ready to put it away for the fall, if you're not going to shoot it again, you know, clean the barrel and you know, run a pass through with a little oil on it. You know, don't use things like WD-40 that will basically lacquer it. Uh, you know, use use good quality stuff, uh, and uh, that you know that's just it. You know, you gotta just keep it keep it clean. Do that. Gotcha. All right, very very good. All right, let's get into the ten rapid fire questions. I didn't prep you for this, and there's a reason for no. That. I just like to I just like to do it <laughs> off the cuff. They come out way more interesting if we do it that way. Okay. <laughs> all right. Number one. Uh, what's your number one hunting tip of all time? Uh, practice. Okay. Yep, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. We all have these things that we 
are, I don't know, we're attached to them somehow. They're uh, either a good luck device or just uh, maybe, maybe it's an accessory unit, something that we feel like if we leave it in the truck, we don't feel like our hunt's going to go real well. Other than your firearm, what's that one thing for you? Well, I'm a knife guy, and it may not be a, you know any particular one knife, but I have to have a knife with me all the time. Okay, gotcha. A knife. Yep. Very nice. What's your biggest pet peeve in life? <laughs> What's my biggest pet peeve in life? Oh, oh. I'd say recently politics. <laughs> I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's been a lot of it out there, that's for yeah. sure. Um, how old are you today, Ken? I'm 66. 66. All right. What would you tell the 30-year-old Ken Jorgensen, knowing what you know today? Oh, well, I, I would I tell, him, I'd tell him is do the best you can do. Um, and I, 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 one of the things, see, I didn't get into the gun industry until I was like 42. I, you know, I've always said, oh, I wish I could have done that when I was 22 or 32. So, right. But, I, but I, I really think one of the biggest things is, you know, really uh, pursue your passions. Yeah. Uh, find the time to do what you like to do and try and be good at it and, and share it. Gotcha. All right. Very good. All right. You're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world and a stranger comes up to you and asks you the question, what do you do for a living? What do you tell them? Uh, I, I tell them that I work for, you know, like today I, I tell them I work for River Firearms and, uh, you know, I, uh, work with the writers and I get to hunt and I've done TV shows and, uh, and I try and be helpful. And one of the things I've done, especially at the Safari Club show and Dallas Safari Club show, which I loved, because I've been to Africa and I've been places I've hunted a lot, and you get a lot of people coming up, especially at Dallas, that they're getting ready to go on their first Africa hunt or they're going on their first Alaska hunt, and they have a lot of questions. And I love being trying to be a useful and helpful and a source of information for them. Uh, you know, even when I get home, I'd, I'd email them things that I you know didn't have or couldn't think of off the top of my head. Cause I, I I love doing that. I just love helping people, uh, basically help them enjoy and have a great hunt. Gotcha. Something that, that they'll remember and want to go back and, you know, do it again. Very cool. What did you have for breakfast this morning? I had a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. a yogurt, and two slices of toast. All right. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> you get your own billboard on the side of a highway. It's a blank canvas. What would it say? I think I'd tell people to enjoy life and, again, per, kind of pursue your passions. Um, and I think as I've gotten older, it's, you know, probably, and, and, and be considerate of others. Okay. All right. Very good. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? I guess there's no single person. Cause I think there are people successful at different levels doing different things. I have a good friend in Africa that's a young man. that's a very successful hunter. He is so knowledgeable. Um, I mean, he's just, he's just a joy to be around because he, he just, he has such a great outlook on life and great outlook on hunting and, and such. And then I, you know, I look at, uh, like Mr. Uh, Pfeiffer in our company, a very successful man. I mean, he's, he's, he's obviously was successful before he came to Ruger. He was a Naval Academy graduate and a submariner and ran other companies and he's come to Ruger. And I think he's done just really great things at Ruger. So I think there's a lot of ways to measure success. And I guess I can't really think of any one person that comes to mind a lot of people that have i've looked up to uh you know over the years and, and uh, appreciate what they've done and and uh, i guess that you know kind of a roundabout answer but i i just don't really have one person i sure. don't believe okay what's a day in the life of ken jorgensen look like well typically be you know get in the office uh i do a lot of my business by email Okay. And so, you know, uh, check email. And sometimes I'll spend almost the entire day on the computer, right? you know, answering emails from people, looking up things for people, uh, getting firearms ordered for writers, uh, maybe going and making a pitch to a writer about a new product or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, might be planning a trip. When I was very involved in the Ruger Rimfire matches, it would be, uh, you know, getting product out to people, you know, collecting FFLs so we can ship things. And, and it's... Uh, it is a variety of things. I mean, it's nothing truly exciting when you're in the office every day. When you get to hit the road, then it's uh, you know it's a little different depending on whether you're going to a match or going to a convention or going on a hunt or whatever. They all vary a little bit too, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's not boring. And I, my mother told me once, I don't remember this, but she said when I was in high school, I said I don't want a job where I sit behind a desk. And she says you certainly don't have that. So gotcha. All right, very good. All right, and finally, you, compared to that, what's a deer hunting day in the life of Ken Jorgensen look like? Oh, uh, getting up way too early. No, uh, <laughs> is that a thing? Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, I'm getting up, having breakfast, getting out, and uh, 
you know, getting out in your blind if you're hunting in a blind or getting out in the truck if you're, you know, the thing, I, I've had a chance to hunt, you know, east and west and, you know, there's different ways of people hunting. I mean, sometimes you sit in the stand, you know, wait for the deer to come to you. You hunt out west, you're, uh, you know, you're out driving and glassing and looking, and if you find something, you're putting a stock on them. So, again, it kind of depends on the, the situation and, and uh, you know, they're all enjoyable. They all they all have their, their moments. I mean, I, I, I enjoy it uh, sometimes when I'm sitting in a blind and maybe an animal you aren't going to shoot comes along, but it's still kind of fun to look through with the scope and put the crosshairs where they're supposed to be and and uh, just kind of stay alert. Gotcha. All right. Very good. Again, this has been great. And where can we find it more about you or find out more about you or Ruger or all the things that Ruger has going well, on or the products like that? Ruger has a tremendous website and it's, uh, you know, just check out Ruger.com. We have obviously all the product is there. Uh, we don't print a catalog anymore because the website's the best way to get the latest information out. As soon as we introduce something, it's on the website. So, uh, you know, check out the website. You can find every product. You can find a spec sheet on every product. We have a lot of videos on the website, everything from personal protection to hunting to, you know, choosing gear and this and that. Uh, it's just a tremendous amount of information on the Ruger website. So um, I would tell people to, you know, take a look at it and, uh, you can find something just to entertain you, or you can find something to inform you, and uh, you know, and uh, you, you can uh, you know just keep going back and looking for more. Nice, right, that's fantastic, uh, Ken. I got to say thank you. It's been absolutely a fantastic hour talking to you, learning about the history of Ruger, learning about you and your life, and uh, your travels around the world, and uh, every all the places you've hunted. And thank you for all the the insights you gave us about firearms just uh how to shoot and uh, how to keep them clean and and all the all that kind of stuff it's been absolutely a pleasure and an honor to have you on our show well thank you very much i've enjoyed it thoroughly thanks to ken jorgensen for joining us on the big buck registry deer hunting podcast it's uh it's always a pleasure talking to ken and learning and this time learning about the history of ruger and sounds like uh, ruger's got some good ideas i kind of like that concept of uh, you always got to find a, a reason for somebody to buy a new gun and that's kind of the concept that ruger runs with so I, I expect lots of new innovations from them over the years to come yeah they always got to stay competitive jay and it's uh it's showing in their product that they're putting out i agree i completely agree Dusty, do we have a Chubby Tines Tip of the Week? Yeah, Jay, we sure do. The Chubby Tines Tip of the Week is sponsored by Morse's Sporting Goods. Firearms, use firearms, bows, use bows. Located at 85 Kentucky Falls Road in Hillsborough, New Hampshire. Give Jim a call at 603-464-3444, morse'sportinggoods.com. Your dollars go further in New Hampshire. There's no sales tax. Morse's Sporting Goods. You know, I'm going to throw out there that I've tried Vapple this year. And, uh, man, it, it, it seems to be a game changer. You know, if, if you're in a state where you can uh, legally put out some deer attractant or, or feed your deer or food plot or whatever you're doing, I suggest that you try some Vapple products. And I've been using the Vapple Apple. Vapple Apple. All right. So you've enjoyed the Vapple products. We gave it a test ride. I've tried it. I, I think it's actually pretty darn good stuff. I've used their soaps and their scent attractants, and it seems to work. So... Hopefully we'll hear more from Vapple over the years to come in this show. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm with you, man. I think it's a good product to test out. Vapple, the vanilla apple. Very, very cool. Thanks to Scentlock Enforcer for sponsoring the show. Thanks to the Eurohanger for sponsoring the show. And thanks to Morse's Sporting Goods for sponsoring the Chubby Tines Tip of the Week. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here on the mic and getting ready for Santa? Shoot me an email. Dusty at BigBuckRegistry.com. Look me up on Facebook. Chubby Tines Outdoors. You can also shoot me a follow on Instagram at Chasing Antler. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Best place to reach me is Jay at BigBuckRegistry.com. And if you'd like to check out our Facebook contingent of almost 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, and maybe if you want to submit your buck over there so you could be famous for a day too, it's BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash Facebook. If you'd like to submit your buck to that Facebook page and you'd like some instructions, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all those instructions will be right there for you. If you'd like to listen to this show other than on iTunes, we are featured in a bunch of different spots. Of course, you can find us on iTunes, and if you do listen on iTunes, leave us a review and subscribe to the show. You can always check us out on YouTube, where all of our audio is converted to video so that you can listen to it like you might listen to a music video. You can find us on Stitcher, Blueberry, 
and now on iHeartRadio. So if you tune into any of those, we're there. And you can always find us on all the major social media platforms, and that's bigbuckregistry.com forward slash Facebook. Likewise, Twitter, Instagram, and Google+. Plus. I think that's every place we're hanging out. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash donate, and all the rewards are right there for you. And we do need your help. We do have some sponsors on this show, but it's not quite enough, and anything you can do to help would be most appreciated. And if you still need a safety harness, we uh, we need some more. So if you have any to donate because you just got some brand new tree stands for Christmas, if you have a harness still in the package that you'd like to donate, shoot me an email, j at bigbuckregistry.com, and we'll collect them. And then if you need some, if you need one, likewise, shoot an email to Jay or Jim or Dusty at bigbuckregistry.com and tell us that you need a harness, and we will get one out to you. We have one in stock, but it's already spoken for. Probably will go out this week. Well, Dusty, I think that's everywhere we're at. And unfortunately, it's time to go. But have a very Merry Christmas. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Foles. And this is the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.